Today we're going to be discussing one popular method of making investment decisions, net present value or NPV for short. NPV can indicate whether a project is financially feasible by discounting its future cash flows using an investor's cost of capital to their present value. We already know how to calculate the present value of annuities, perpetuities, and single payments, but in reality, most projects are messy. They involve uneven cash flows occurring at different times throughout the life of the project. Today, we'll learn how to apply these formulas to more complex financial decisions. So first, we'll go over what NPV is and how we can calculate it. Second, we'll talk about how to set up a timeline in order to discount the cash flows over the life of the project. And lastly, we'll look at how to apply all of this to an example. To calculate net present value, calculate the present value of a project's future cash inflows and subtract its future cash outflows plus any initial investment costs. Basically, we factor in everything we gain from the project and everything we spend and express all of it in today's dollars. Typically, we'll have one large upfront cost at the beginning of the investment, but sometimes we'll also see negative net cash flows during the life of the investment. Once we determine a project's net present value, we can choose whether to accept or reject it. The rule of thumb is that if NPV is positive, we should accept. A positive NPV means that all the revenues in today's dollars are greater than all of the costs in today's dollars. This means that the project is expected to add value to the firm because we're earning more than we're spending. So an NPV of zero isn't bad. It means that we're earning exactly the minimum required rate of return, or in other words, we're breaking even. In order to calculate the net present value of a project, we have to first estimate cash flows, second, estimate required rate of return, and third, discount our cash flows to solve for net present value. In practice problems and tests, the information from steps 1 and 2 is given to you. In a real-life scenario, you'll have to estimate these based on forecasts and market interest rates. However, we still have to know how to use accounting figures like net income to determine our cash flows. Remember that net cash inflow does not always equal net income. We discuss this in more detail in the video Differentiating Sunk Costs and Opportunity Costs. For now, let's focus on step 3, solving for NPV. So remember, the theory of NPV is very simple. We're just applying our time value formulas. The trick to mastering NPV problems is staying organized. I recommend using a timeline so you can keep track of all the cash inflows and outflows. Once we have a timeline, we can develop a plan for calculating NPV efficiently using a combination of time value of money formulas. Let's walk through the steps of dissecting a problem together. Pause the video and read over this problem. Note that the required rate of return that we use to calculate the present value of the project's cash flows is not always the required rate of the investor or company. This is because the discount rate we use for NPV reflects the time value of money and riskiness of the project, which may be a different level of riskiness than the investor's personal discount rate. For example, if, rather than starting your dream corn-themed food truck business, your next best alternative is putting your money in a savings account that earns 2%. Your personal rate of 2% here isn't appropriate to discount the far riskier cash flows of a food truck business. Let's make a timeline for this problem. Then we can begin sorting our cash flows along this timeline. Cash flows that occur in the same year can be consolidated, since we'll discount them by the same number of periods. First, let's determine the time horizon for this project. The problem tells us that the project will last 7 years, and so we're concerned with cash flows that occur between now, which we'll call year 0, and the end of seven years. And now we can fill in our timeline. I like to start with the one-time inflows and outflows, and then deal with the ongoing operating cash flows at the end. First, let's look at the project's initial cost. At the beginning of the project, we must spend $20,000 on the truck, plus $4,000 on the grill, and must invest $5,000 into working capital. We need to have some working capital available to fulfill our day-to-day -day operations like having enough inventory on hand or satisfying our short-term debts. But we can usually expect that some of this will be recovered at the end of the project. In this situation, we receive all of it back at the end of the project. Be careful not to miss this detail just because there's no number listed. Writing out numbers as words, or eliminating the numbers altogether, are common tricks to look for in NPV problems. But remember that the $5,000 we spend today and the $5,000 we get back in seven years are not equal because of the time value of money. 
After all, we lose the ability to use the money for other productive purposes when it's tied up in this project. We must also consider the $1,000 cost to renew the food sales license after three years. This cost will be lower than $1,000 in today's terms due to the time value of money. We don't need to worry about the cost of this year's license, since this is a sunk cost, not an incremental or differential cost, meaning that, regardless of whether or not we take on this project, you'll end up paying for the license, so we don't need to factor it into our decision. And lastly, let's include the $5,000 we expect to receive at the end of the seven years when we sell the truck. Now let's look at our operating cash flows. Because the advertising expense occurs every year, we'll factor this into our annual operating cash flows. We will combine the revenues and costs for each year to get our net cash inflows. For year one, we'll earn $2,000 and spend $500 on our operations, plus $100 in advertising. This leaves us with a net inflow of $1,400. We get a net inflow of $3,400 in year two, $3,400 in year three, $3,400 in year four, $3,400 in year five, $3,400 in year six, and $7,900 in year seven. So now that we've mapped out our cash flows, we can make a plan of attack for discounting these cash flows to their present values. Of course, you can take the net cash flow from each period and discount them individually back to year zero. But there's a more efficient method. I like to see whether I can save time by discounting multiple cash flows at once using an annuity formula, and discount any leftover cash flows individually using the simple present value formula. From years two to six, we have net cash inflows of $3,400. I'm choosing not to combine the $1,000 outflow in year three, so I can treat this as an annuity with fixed payments of $3,400. We can discount all the cash flows to year one by taking $3,400 over 0 0.09 times one minus one over 1.09 to the power of five. Now we can discount the whole thing to year zero by dividing it by 1.09. Next, let's present value the loose ends. We'll sum the cash flows in year seven and discount them to year zero by dividing by one plus 0 0.09 to the power of seven. We'll discount the $1,000 cash outflow in year three by dividing it by one plus 0 0.09 to the power of three. Remember to keep the negative sign, representing a cash outlay, as paying for this license lowers our net present value. Now that all of our cash flows are in present value terms, we can combine them and subtract the initial cost which is already expressed in today's dollars because these costs occur in the present. Now we're left with a net present value of negative $6,563. This is how much more the project generates in cash outflows in today's dollars than in cash inflows in today's dollars at our given interest rate. This rate factors in the risk, opportunity cost, and inflation. So anything under zero means that we haven't covered our cost of capital. Therefore, we should not move forward with this project. If we take on this project, the value of our company is expected to fall by $6,563. The share price will fall accordingly as well. Perhaps this strange corn dream is not as amazing as we thought. Because the aim of an investment is to increase shareholder wealth, as a general rule, we should accept any project with a positive NPV. Of course, the company may have strategic reasons for taking on an investment with a negative NPV, such as complying to government regulations or protecting the environment. We typically make the important assumption that a company has unlimited funds to take on these projects, either through borrowing or using its existing equity. The cost of borrowing is already reflected in the required rate of return. However, if we have limited funds to spend, we may want to select the investments that maximize our NPV per dollar spent. We can compare projects by looking at their profitability index, or the present value of future inflows divided by the project's initial costs. Alternatively, if we're forced to choose only one project, we want to select the one that maximizes our NPV in dollar terms to increase the value of the company by as much as possible. Ultimately, NPV is an effective evaluation tool because it uses relevant future cash flows, unlike methods that use accounting numbers. It adjusts for the time value of money. It adjusts for risk. It provides information about whether we're creating value to the firm, and it provides a single number that we can use to compare between investments. So to recap, today we went over NPV and how we can set up timelines to dissect and solve NPV problems. Remember that there's no one right way to solve an NPV problem. It's just important to stay organized and to discount your cash flows in a way that's fast and makes sense for you. Thanks for watching.